Testing, one, two, three, testing. Try saying, uh-huh, uh-huh, yep, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, perfect. uh-huh, That's uh-huh, yeah. That's how I'm going to gauge it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think maybe I will. I was watching some videos of people recording podcasts, and they're like here. Yeah. They're like... Six inches yeah, or so. I didn't want and if you had a pop... That felt phallic. Well, the, the, uh, the microphone shape and the... Yeah, no, I mean, I, I get that. Okay, I, are you ready, Chris? I'm ready. Are you ready? Full Cast and Crew is a podcast that chooses a noteworthy film and gives Chris... Me. And Jason, that's me, room to discuss, diverge, and dive down rabbit holes. Our hope is that if you haven't seen the movie we're talking about, you'll be inspired to check it out. And if you have seen the movie, you'll be either awed and impressed at our command of the material and our thoughtful insights, or you'll wonder what the hell we're talking about. We often wonder that too. Our episode this week is about Chameleon Street, a brilliant and provocative 1989 independent film written by, directed by, and starring Wendell B. Harris Jr., The film is a social satire based on the life of Detroit con artist and high school dropout William Douglas Street Jr., who successfully impersonated professional reporters, lawyers, athletes, and surgeons, going so far as to perform 36 successful hysterectomies before spending time in prison for his impersonations. In 1990, the Sundance Film Festival described it as one of the first films to examine how mellifluously race, class, and role-playing morph into the social fabric of America. Critic and film executive Brandon Harris, writing in Filmmaker Magazine, said that the film, quote, reveals a black consciousness as messy, hysterical, and laden with the unspoken burdens of otherness as those that belong to most of the black folks I know, end quote. Chameleon Street won the Grand Jury Prize at the 1990 Sundance Film Festival. Watching the film today, it's clear that Harris was and is a unique and layered voice exploring weighty themes and issues in a sardonic but emotional manner that presaged movies and auteur visions like Jordan Peele's Get Out, Boots Riley's Sorry to Bother You, and TV series like Donald Glover's Atlanta, Issa Rae's Insecure, and Terrence Nance's Random Acts of Flyness. So it's all the more shocking and perhaps not surprising that Wendell Harris never made another feature film and acted in only two other films subsequent to Chameleon Street. And as you'll hear, that's not through lack of trying on his part. The movie is thus a fascinating Escher loop where the questions it explores of what avenues are open to black Americans and what kind of space white America holds and declines to hold for black people also played out in the real life aftermath of the film's premiere and win at Sundance. Chris, thank you, folks. See you next week. <laughs> Nothing more need be said. Uh, that was very well done. You had you had seen this. Uh, I've seen film it many before, times. Right? You had seen it many times. Many times. I I first saw this film uh, probably I think in, in in reading up about it. It sounds like the VHS became available in in maybe 1993 or 1994. Mm-hmm. I probably saw it in 1994. I remember seeing it when I was living in New Haven after college. Um, and it was part of my isolated, isolating VHS film renting from a, v, uh, a, a video store that was around the corner from my apartment. And I would just rent armfuls of movies and, yeah. and pull then up in my apartment and watch them and yeah. never leave the house. Um, and somehow, I, this was a very, this was like a cool college town uh, video store. So it always had really cool independent movies. And this is where, in this era, this was obviously, I guess, a natural one for them to stock. And I remember just being mostly taken at first by its tone, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's comedy um, and it's the assuredness of its vision um, and the acting and the writing and the guy's voice and just being entranced by this sort of person I'd never heard of before um, who was, who, who made such a, a great film. I mean, and I've just always enjoyed it and um, have just enjoyed watching it over the years. And I always kind of, appreciated it new. So I was, I was glad to watch it again. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious to hear what you thought about it. Cause you probably had never heard of it or seen it prior said, to it, just the other day. Not only had I not seen it, I had never heard of it. And the story behind it, I, I, I always do find it fascinating when somebody kind of falls off or is pushed off mm-hmm. the radar, like the writer, uh, Henry Roth, he wrote a book and then it took him something like 60 years sure. to do his follow up. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> When it can Harris take some is time. On track, maybe Arbiter Roswell will uh, yeah. will appear. Or there's another a Swedish filmmaker, Roy Anderson, who mm-hmm. um, his second feature was such a big flop, he retreated, made commercials for a quarter century, mm-hmm. came back and won, I think it was 
can or vents. But I do remember just, I had never heard of him, but a movie uh, mm-hmm. of his came out and then reading about this long stretch of time where right. nothing was made. So again, Wendell Harris, do not give up hope. And Wendell Harris fans, yeah. don't give up hope. So I had never heard of this. Hearing the name, I had no idea what it meant, even mm-hmm. sort of when watching it. The fact that that was his name, yeah. as opposed to it being about an actual street, yeah. was already a big, <laughs> a big like surprise. a big surprise. <laughs> so I loved it. Not only did I have no idea where it was going, but its energy, like you said, was so, the best word I can use is madcap because it went so strongly in different directions. But there was definitely control and seething anger behind it. That's why I sort of hesitate with the word madcap. But it did have a sort of um, gleeful, exciting, wide-ranging energy and was very, very profound. And that was the beginning of the golden age of the independent Mm -hmm. auteur and the fact that his career would not take off in the same way that Steven Soderbergh's, uh, Hal Hartley's, even all of these names that are sort of easily identifiable, why there's this huge hole where his career should be, both as a filmmaker and as an actor, just knowing that that is there gives it even more um, strength and poignancy because you know that it's it's a very singular piece. The story of how it came to be made, he's he said in interviews that it's sort of the prototypical independent feature because he literally cobbled the money together from friends and family. I think his parents were the single largest oh, contributor yes. to the budget. <laughs> EPs. Um, and his brother. Um, and I believe he said some other sort of prominent African-Americans from Flint, Michigan, mm-hmm. which is where Wendell B. Harris was from and where a lot of the movie was filmed. And interestingly, this movie was shot concurrently with another film that its cinematographer was also working on. That's right. Roger and Me. Uh, Michael Daniel Morris. S. Noga was Daniel the cinematographer Noga, right. on this. And I guess one of the cinematographers or one of the camera people yeah. on Roger and on Me. On Roger and Me at the same time. So, Which, uh, if we were going to stick with the strict full cast and crew sort of dive down the yeah. IMDb, it would be a very short episode. It would. Uh, uh, I don't believe anyone only- in the cast other than... Wendell B. Harris Jr. has any other credits other than the professional female basketball player who plays herself in a very funny scene where he's pretending to be uh, a reporter interviewing right. her for a feature article. Well, I began to subtly steer the conversation into her personal life. Of course, the key word is subtle. Have you ever had an orgasm? What's it have to do with the cover story? Well... You know, the big picture. Oh, oh, well. It's funny you should bring that up. Because just the other day I was talking to a friend of mine about how women fake orgasms. (laughs) And I think that's crazy. Yeah. I'm a big fan of the film Out of Sight, which is a Soderbergh feature with George Clooney, Jennifer Lopez. It's based on an Elmore Leonard book. And Wendell B. Harris Jr. has a very small part in that film as an FBI agent who... It's, have you seen the movie? I haven't. Okay. It's such a, it's a great movie. He plays an FBI agent who's kind of a dick and kind of um, sexist and sort of talks down to the Jennifer Lopez character. I want two men outside, front and back. Conroy, Jameson, go on up to six, cover both ends of the hall. Your primary, your secondary, and your point man. You gonna use a ram? Yeah. Why? The manager's door is metal. You know what I mean? They might all be. A ram on a metal door makes a lot of noise for what good it does. I got a shot clock round for my shotgun how to do the trick. Fine. Whatever. He has real presence in his handful of scenes, and he commits to being kind of the heel in a funny way. And it's sort of a throwaway part. It's only, yeah. He's only in two scenes in the movie, I think. Um, but I remember, I don't know when that film came out. It probably must have been the 2000s, I would say. Um, but I remember when that film came out and just the voice. I mean, Wendell B. Harris has such a distinctive voice yeah. and you'll, you'll, you'll hear it as, as you listen to this podcast. And I think that's when I first sort of went like, well, wait a minute, that's, that's the guy who was in Chameleon Street. We can talk more about the story. It, it's a fascinating w- – it, it's not going to be surprising to many people who might be listening to this – to hear his version of why his career never happened. Mm -hmm. And I'll admit that when I was reading his interviews and and articles about the movie, 
you know, you and I are both in the in the business a little bit, and we've probably been around people for whom it didn't work out or didn't have the career they wanted or felt they were supposed to have. Been and, around. And in. <laughs> I have been. I am that. I am we, we, we are. We are now. Yeah, I am that, I'm that too. Um, so sometimes when I read that, I read it with a little bit of a jaundiced eye or I think, okay, but, you know, how did you sabotage your own career here? Or, you know, did you have a fear of flying or any of the things that we encounter a lot in, right. in our business where people for various, very understandable human reasons, maybe don't take advantage of the opportunities that are presented to them. But then when you start looking into what Wendell Harris is talking about, you realize he's onto something and he has a very provocative and truthful story to tell. I went back and did did the research, people. You know, I, I went and did the long, laborious clicking of the internet <laughs> um, because he has one comment in an interview where he talks about being the only director to win the Grand Jury Prize at Sundance who never was a, was allowed. I'm going to say allowed because he's working in industry as we as I work in, as you work in, where we need people to say yes to the things we're right. proposing and pitching them to do. No one said yes to any of the films or projects that he proposed after becoming a director who won the Grand Jury Prize at Sundance and a time when that meant something. Right. So he won it in what, 1990? Mm -hmm. Since the origin of the Sundance Film Festival, all of the directors who won Grand Jury Prize for drama, so that's the dramatic, not the documentary feature winners, but the dramatic picture winners, literally every single one of them, except Wendell B. Harris Jr. went on to direct one or more subsequent feature films. But he never directed another feature and acted in only two movies. Now, taking them separately, as an actor, I think he's incredibly compelling and so unique and has probably one of the greatest voices I've ever heard in cinema. I mean, how he could not even just have be the narrator of Frontline or some long running a voice <laughs> voiceover career. career. Like even cartoons, some, like you cartoons, said. Cartoons, like. Not only is his voice beautiful, but he also has this incredible quality of realness or spontaneity. Yeah. It seems almost quasi documentary just mm -hmm. because of the ticks and physical movements and, and sort of stammers, the things that can easily come across and a lot of actors will do as sort of affect. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we buy it and there's a certain, and yet with him, it's so animated and so alive and so real. Let's get another record straight while we're talking about Mr. That, Horton. That, you that, never had photographs, Polaroid photographs of Willie Horton with girls, did you? Get the record straight. That record. Did you? I beg your pardon? You never had Polaroid pictures of Willie Horton with girls, did you? No, no. In fact, had you ever witnessed Willie Horton cavorting with other women? No, no. Then why, please tell me, why would you concoct such a licentious, low-down, loathsome lie? My objective, my objective was to present Mrs. Horton while her husband was away with something that was so wrenching that she would be Panic. I wanted to press her panic button. Then why? This is not a, this is not a big expose you're doing. This is all then, then a matter of public question. record. Answer this question. Why? Why what? Would you concoct? I wanted to get the money. Make some money. Man, we need some money. For the money. You're a liar, aren't you, Mr. Street? <laughs> His performance and his interpretation of the character sort of overlap in a way that is really stunning mm -hmm. um, because it just feels so, so raw. There is this, this overlap between all of those things. He really feels very confident, but also unrehearsed. It's happening in the moment, and yet it never feels arbitrary. It feels like somebody who's just living through it in that moment, which is it's unsettling uh, to watch. It's it's sort of, it's that good. And he's also portraying a character who is closed off, who f parts of whom are closed off to himself. If that's any kind of proper syntax, I've been watching Trump today, so I'm not speaking clearly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he, the the character that he's playing isn't really aware of everything that he's doing, or or I should say, he isn't really aware of why he's doing everything he's doing. But the actor playing the character is very aware of yeah. why he's doing what he's doing. I find that so compelling to watch. And obviously, the story at its heart is about this person's experience as a black man in America. So that part of it, I have no personal firsthand knowledge of. 
But the meta thing that I'm attracted to in this movie is just the story of him as, from what I can glean, someone who stumbled across this story, which took place near his hometown. Uh, William Douglas Street Jr., the actual William Douglas Street, was a Detroit, Detroit native. Right. And he was only like arrested for the final time or final. Not you know, too long not ago. Dead. 2015. Yeah, well, he's uh, still at it. Buying a $7,000 His career has worked road, out great. A 7, 000, yeah. <laughs> well, you can't buy that kind of longevity. <laughs> you know, uh, he bought a $7,000 ro- <laughs> Rolex with a bounced check. And uh, then they sort of found him. And in his car, he had um, a medical jacket for this other doctor, this former Green Beret, 10 years younger than him. Uh, there were just all of these great details about this guy. But what you were talking about, um, Wendell Harris make, makes the choice to make this the story of what it means to be a black man in, mm-hmm. in America and how you what you have to do to survive. But William Douglas Street's story could have been any number of things. Mm-hmm. You know, they touch upon in the beginning, like, why is he doing what yeah. he does? Is it a compulsion? Is it malice? Wendell Harris made a definite choice and a fascinating one. And I only sort of am making such a point of it because it just shows how committed and certain and confident a filmmaker he was to see in this story a perfect metaphor Mm -hmm. for the difficulties, the contradictions Mm -hmm. of being a black man in the Mm -hmm. United States and to to make the story about that. And in a way that was the whole being more than the sum of its parts. Like you could pick apart all the strands from it, but it's infinite because of not just the performance, but but the the many strands and contradictions that go into this character. A thing that I respond to on almost a sort of cellular level is... I'm so attracted to the concept that here's this guy, Wendell B. Harris Jr., who who hears about this story taking place and and wills this movie into being. I gather that he had some experience working in the medium a little bit. I think mm-hmm. he's a Juilliard trained actor. So, William Hurt and Mandy Patinkin were his uh, classmates. Were they? Yeah. Okay, so he's in this world to some degree, but it has that thing that you can't really find in many other movies that are made through more of the corporate process where it's this clear vision that he seized upon and willed it into being at great expense to himself, his parents, his his brother, the people that gave money to it. I just respond to the idea that if the bells go off and you see a story or you you, you come across something like this, whoever you are, follow that and yeah. have the courage to figure out how to bring it into being. Now, you could say that everything that happened subsequent to what should have been the beginning of a long career as a director, to have a vision, a voice like that, have such a clear vision for his first movie to also be this mix of high and low culture, to have this ability to pivot and jump around and be funny and poignant and deep and disturbing, have it be both, it's the linear telling of a slice of a person's real life story, but on another level, it's about so much more. You you bring this movie to Sundance, he wins the grand jury prize for dramatic feature. And then I really encourage people, and by the time this goes up, we'll put some links to some of the things he's written, um, some of the interviews that he's done, because the stories are pretty, they're, they're funny, and he tells them with a sense of humor but they're also just so true and horrifying. The most depressing fact is that of the opportunities, and there were some that came on the heels of this movie winning at Sundance, I think it was Warner Brothers purchased the rights for $250,000 not to distribute the movie because the movie never obtained a distributor after winning at Sundance. Mm -hmm. They wanted to remake the movie, and he tells these funny but heartbreaking stories, of the handful of actors that at various times were attached to replace him. Arsenio Hall vehicle. Wesley Snipes. Wesley Snipes. Make it an action kind of movie. Sinbad. It's like a silly family friendly movie. Um, Will Smith, who he also says went on in like two other movies to do the Rubik's Cube solving moment. Yeah. Um, So (laughs) that's the most Hollywood thing ever. Like here's a piece of art. We don't want to get behind that piece of art and put it out and associate our company with it, even though we don't really have to pay for it because it was already made. Right. All we have to do is devote one-tenth of one iota of the vast distribution machinery we already possess to say, hey, this guy deserves a chance. This is a a directorial vision that's worth investing in and cultivating because 
even for their own reasons, man, this guy's going to make us a lot of money over the years because, you know, film directors don't grow on trees and this guy's a real auteur. He, he has something to say. Let's mm-hmm. get behind him and support him. No, no, no. Let's buy the rights to his movie and then hope to remake the movie in some lesser form. And along the way, we'll, nev- we'll make sure that not many people see the actual movie because right. that would harm our ability to make money off this horrible remake. So it's a crazy story. Right. You know, there are two narratives about Hollywood and, and uh, that Wendell Harris even refers to in some of the interviews. There's the idea that Hollywood's just about money. It doesn't really matter this or that. It's just what will make money. But here's a product that obviously speaks to people. What is the point of suppressing it? If it were just about profit, it would have been able to have been seen much easier earlier. And then there's the other narrative that I think he credits to Orson Welles, uh, that Hollywood does have an idea of itself as setting the national conversation, as communicating morality and the way the world should be. That sounds kind of conspiratorial, and there's part of me that's so pragmatic that the money thing just makes more sense. And yet, at the same time, you look at this particular situation and you look at just how complicated and how disturbing, how unsettling is probably a better word than disturbing, how unsettling this this film is. And then to think, for it to then get this unique treatment, both of him and of the film itself, it does make that conspiratorial theory seem much more plausible. Do you mean unsettling if you happen to be a white, middle-aged film executive in 1990? Like, did you think they found it unsettling to watch a movie that was about these things you know or had I, this sort of political point of view? As <laughs> Wendell Harris says that the joke became at some point, how do you get a contract in Hollywood in the early 90s? You're a black director who's not Wendell Harris. Yeah. It's not that visions of black directors were not allowed, but there were certain kinds that felt safe and comfortable. The sort of expanse of his vision and the contradictions and the complications, not just of the character, but of the character in society and how much of society sort of pushed him to that, that reflecting back and forth uh, and the kind of insight that it showed, th- that still reads as unsettling today. We're in a time that where uh, race relations are not great. And uh, looking at this vision, you, you see there's no answer to it. I don't know if you saw um, I Am Not Your Negro that oh, came the, out. the James Baldwin documentary? Yeah. yeah. I haven't seen that. It also had some unsettling things to say that seemed apropos with this because it did not have an easy narrative. In, in a certain sense, it could be boiled down to the United States racism is so baked into it mm-hmm. that there's no solution. So you can boil it down and it's simple in the sense that you can that you can say that, but all the tendrils that grow out of that and what that means and how it affects everything and how you can't r- remove it like a uterus in a hysterectomy that, mm-hmm. <laughs> that the character, but the fact that you can't remove it, that it's not a discrete thing, that that complication is to me what I think is unsettling. And to say nothing against any of the the uh, African-American directors in the early 90s who had more success, I think those visions of something like Boys in the Hood mm-hmm. was just a little bit more palatable and a little bit more again, discreet. It's like, okay, you know, there's a gang problem in LA and, you know, we're sort of showing it, but it becomes sort of self-contained. Yeah. And it, that's the thing about him, that there was nothing self-contained about it. Mm-hmm. Not only his intelligence and his um, his vision, but I think what he was saying about the condition of being a black man and about American society was so um, far-reaching that yeah. that's the thing that, that, that couldn't be allowed to be considered or seen. Full Cast and Crew is brought to you by the award-winning comedy series Philly Court. It's like a fake Judge Judy, but if way more of the cases involved Percocet and illegal fireworks. Philly Court Season 2, premiering now on Facebook. Just like and follow Chuckle or Comedy on Facebook for the latest episodes. Philly Court did not actually win any awards, my dude, but the guys in Vinny's called it awesome, except for Brian Welsh, who's a fucking dumbass anyways, and I'm going to beat his ass for stealing with Twisted Tees. Yeah, the movies that you would think of the era present a slice of life of black culture... This movie is presenting that is presenting black consciousness as it encounters, encroaches upon, and tries to exist or coexist in white society. But it's not made easy for white viewers to appreciate it. The confidence with which it's presented is 
this is something we're dealing with. And you and I have no familiarity with that. Right. And, and I think that's the, that's the unsettling part maybe that you're talking about when people viewed the movie or thought about him making additional movies. But probably it's just as simple as he was a little too smart for the system or the system didn't have any way to recognize someone who looked like him <laughs> being given responsibility and millions of dollars mm -hmm. and to be, to make movies, which this guy clearly had the same type of career that anyone of his contemporaries winning in this era. To me, it seems that he's deserving of having had that career. Now, I, I will say, when you read about some of the projects that he pitched, I mean, I would love to see his re-envisioning of Caligula. If people can look that up, what his vision was. Right. It's crazy. It's it's almost, it's kind of like a, um, uh, who's the guy that wanted to make the crazy version of Dune uh, that they made the documentary about? Oh, uh, Jodorowsky. Yeah, Jodorowsky. It's, it's a little like that, but man, it would have been brilliant. Well, what he's he, talking about and the casting, it just sounds like, wow. I mean, of yeah, course, when that's he describes so, it, he, talk, he compares it to like Mel Brooks, yes. to like Blazing Saddles. But it's, you know, it's out there. Yeah. And his other, magna, the, the other magnum opus that gets talked about is this like, 24 year quest to make a movie about Roswell. I yeah, also so want to see that movie very much. I'm a little bit unsure because there are two things. Uh, there was a Kickstarter yes. a couple years ago for Yeshua versus Frankenstein in 3D, which, if you read about it, sounds a lot like uh, Arbiter Roswell, which is. Yes. The, well, uh, so I'm wondering if those are the same project with two different names, if he tried to raise, you know, I don't know. But either way, whatever. Cert, whatever, either and and or both of those sound freaking nuts. There's I would like a quasi documentary to, as well as, and you know, he returns the favor to Steven Soderbergh, who gave yes, him an acting job. He gives yes. Steven Soderbergh an acting job. I, I would like to read the description from the Kickstarter for Yeshua versus Frankenstein in 3D, by the way, uh, which he describes as a riveting 120 minute documentary in 3D that explores German sociologist, philosopher, and musicologist. Theodore W. Adorno's efforts to, quote, lobotomize America through media. On one hand, it sounds totally insane. On yeah. the other hand, it feels like we're living that. Yes. And, and so the saddest part, and you can look this up, look at the Kickstarter. I mean- It raised it, less than $3,000. It, it raised less than $3,000, and it had a film clip that included Soderbergh, who was acting in the film, and I think you're right. I think that that documentary must have been a part of what the Roswell film, which sounds like the Roswell film was developed within the studio system and kind of was probably mainstream at one point. But maybe he, maybe his interests are so sort of what they are that he was uncompromising and had to follow down these rabbit holes. And it led to something that was just maybe not commercial in a way that his his financial backers of the studios felt. Right. Well, you know, uh, in one of the interviews, he was saying, you know, he was hired to do something about Roswell. He mm -hmm. researched a script, the direction that he wanted to go, they were simply not interested in. So I don't think right. he ever finished that script, but the research that uh, came out of it and the sort of reading and mm -hmm. all of that stuff that became the background and, and the, the direction that he wanted to go he did go. And that's, you know, what Arbiter Roswell was supposed to be or may still be. They do say that uh, on the DVD of Chameleon Street, you have a 30-minute trailer mm. for Arbiter Roswell. It's worth getting for that alone. Yeah. Um, I, I think I'm also struck, you know, we're living in a moment now where you have really interesting films and television series coming from black creators that are very similar to this. This is the first time I've watched it since the era of films like Get Out, the ones that we mentioned mm -hmm. in the intro. Um, I just Atlanta. saw Sorry to Bother You last week. And Sorry to Bother so You. so much. So much of that, right? Yeah. And and, then, and this is what, 28 years before mm -hmm. that. I wonder, I would love to see him talk about those projects and those movies and those TV shows. Or And I would love to hear those creators talk about their familiarity with this movie, which yeah. which I wonder if they have. I, I imagine they do. And but there's a story there. And and it I wonder if it's a story worth exploring in a documentary about Wendell Harris. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, because to be as talented as he is, man, as an actor, he's so good. I just can't believe that uh that we're not more familiar with him as an actor. I mean, he has two right. other roles. One is in Out of Sight, and the other is in what's the Road Trip. Road trip. Tom Green. 
Tom Green must be a fan of Chameleon Street. Right. You know what I mean? Like, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I haven't seen Road Trip, so I don't know who he plays. He plays a, I think a, a professor. Okay. But, but even that, like Soderbergh, now that we know the backstory, we know Soderbergh must have been a fan right. and a friend a fr- yeah. and saw the talent. And so cast him when he could in, mm-hmm. in Out of Sight. Um, and apparently starred in some version of the Roswell movie or the German philosophical 120 minute 3 d documentary. <laughs> um, so I'm just curious what the Tom Green connection, you know, right. maybe it was, maybe it's the same time Tom Green maybe stumbled across this movie and was like, wow, this guy's a genius. Yeah. You know, um, anytime I can, uh, work with him, I will. I don't know. Like you really. said, there's a story there. Yeah. How much of that story has to do with him and his integrity? You know, perhaps yeah. he has no interest in doing. Maybe. You know, there's certainly a lot of. He certainly uh, has high minded references. Yeah. This movie alone is is filled with references to all kinds of European cinema and and f- philosophy. And, you know, so you can imagine it not. But, but I mean, again, this came out in the era of independent cinema. Yeah. Where, like if there was ever a time to do that stuff, that was the time. And look, <laughs> even in, even people who make those kind of uh, pretentious references, many of which I got. <laughs> I mean, I would never accuse you of that. <laughs> I don't need to. Hey, but even those people are not above doing Hawaiian punch commercials or. Nor should or, they be. Or what, that's what I mean. Like the very fact that there are only three credits on his eye, yeah. that there's not a guest spot on a, on a TV show. Because like that's a lot of money relatively quickly. Is that because he was simply had no interest in doing acting in not playing a leading role? You know, yeah, that could be part of this. All of those are possibilities, and and mm-hmm. is all that I'm getting at. That there might have been an easier life offered that he was mm-hmm. too high minded to want to take. Well, I gather from from exploring that he ran at the time of making the movie, and perhaps still runs some form of a visual effects house or a commercial house podcast. You're a little far from the, uh, from the mic. Oh, I thought you were pointing at me as if. Go away. Yeah. Go away. <laughs> or, or he does what we do. Um, yeah, he's. He does, what, he makes microphones or yeah. he. <laughs> um, no, I, I think he, ha- he, he has or had some type of a production business in Flint. Yes. Um, as far as the movie, it, it just. The style, the look of it, you know, it's got that flat lighting and sort of uh, very, I don't want to say amateurish, but I mean, it's an independent film in the best sense of the word. Um, But it has real style and it has real assurance. And um, so, uh, like you said, he has a video, film and video production company in Flint called Prismatic Images Limited. And before making the film, he spent a few years making like wedding videos and some PSAs for the local government and that sort of thing. And the reason why I mention all of that is because Roger and Me was shot same year, literally using the same, <laughs> the cinematographer was on that film as well. The two films look very, very different, which I can't help but think is a deliberate choice. And to think that he sort of made his life or made his base creating these kind of industrial films and then to use that aesthetic to show us the subjective experience of of a black man trying to make money in order to survive. I wanted to get the money. Money. Make some money. Man, we need some money. For the money. There's something about the industrial film aesthetic exploring that because so much of it is about commerce. It's, you know, we haven't talked too much about some of the themes of the film mm-hmm. besides the sort of grander ones, but it is interesting what starts to go and he's like, I got to make money. Yeah. Like that's it. I, you know, I'm... I got to survive because everybody can relate to that. And yet what that means for a black man in Flint, Michigan in the late 70s and early 80s is very different than it would have been for for you or I. Right. And I think what he does so well is show that for for the character who is obviously super intelligent, could could probably do whatever he wanted to do, it's not so much that he's bent this way towards criminality. Right. It's presented that these are the avenues that are open to me. Yeah. I mean, if you're not going to let me participate, then I, I got to get in however however I can. One of the things that's that's so great about the movie is everything, like whether it's a hospital, a law firm, the entertainment business, all things that he infiltrates, they're ostensibly closed off to someone like him. But be, almost because of that, he's able to slip through and yeah. and exist in there because no one really knows what to make of him. Nowadays, you know, we see a lot of representations on film and TV where I think white people in a movie like this 
existing today would be hyper conscious of their whiteness and they would be their their actions on screen would be written in such a manner to to sort of point out with humor uh, how silly white people can react to people of color in various situations. But this movie doesn't really do that. I mean, it has a lot of fun at the expense of the other characters or the white characters, but it doesn't sort of, it doesn't point the finger at them in a way, just sort of, they're just themselves. It's kind of like, mm-hmm. they're just themselves and their lack of intelligence or or willingness to be fooled is just kind of presented as is. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, there's only, there's that one kind of overt racism moment in mm-hmm. the, in the restaurant bar where he's having dinner with his wife and the, the drunken guy at the bar comes over and says horrible racist things. Don't you know Michelob is for white man? And you know that the white man runs this world? What, is that what it says on the label? How much? How much what? Much what? Come on, cut the comedy. Bitch is fine. <laughs> and I'm willing to pay through the nose when the ass has got class. Uh, honey, come on, take a drink here. Come on. You know what I mean? Porch monkey? You did say more funky. That is what he said, isn't it? More funky. Not porch monkey. More funky. Hey. And then the Chameleon Street character uh, engages in a... In a which I think is lifted maybe from a George Carlin record or something, which is all the different ways to say it's fuck. Word fuck, yeah. Um, but, you know, he, he, he uses his intellect to trump the ignorant racist in the scene. But none of the people at the law firm or the hospital, they don't really exhibit racism towards the character. They're just kind of clueless and allow themselves to be duped by someone who's smarter than they are. Mm-hmm. That's why I think when you, when you, when you read him talking about the movie, he says very clearly, like, the first thing I was interested in is the story of this guy. Yeah. Not not all the sort of higher-minded things that we're talking about and the other layers that exist. His first interest, and you'll understand this, was as an actor, he thought, oh, this is, this this role is perfect for me. And it is. Yeah. Right? Because as an actor, he gets to do all these different, inhabit all of these different personas that Street inhabits. Then I, you know, then I sort of realized secondarily, is that a word? Secondarily? Sure. It is now. not. He realized secondarily um, that it, it it is a metaphor for all of these other things that he was interested in himself yeah. as a black man, as an artist. And, and both of those things work very seamlessly together. I love the stories where you're just telling the story and, and it's a story you can get caught up and swept away in. But because of what the story is about, it's about so many bigger yeah. themes. Maybe Which that's is, every story in the world, and I'm just sort of pointing out the obvious. You, you, would, the then, hand, you would then chime in and go, yeah, I mean, that's the nature of storytelling, sort Jason, of going in back general, to yeah, band days, sort of the whole paintings on, point of it. on sides of things. That's kind of what, yeah. So go ahead, pop my bubble, Chris. Tell me. Uh, no, that's, that's all right. You've already done such a good job of popping it yourself. <laughs> but look, that's such a tough balancing act. Like you said, the fact that he was just very conscious, like, I'm telling this guy's story, event yep. A to B. Yep. That's not the same as plot. That is more about like having a propulsive thing, just moving mm-hmm. forward. And those resonances, the metaphors, the it all grows out of it. You sometimes want to be more highfalutin. You're thinking like, oh, I really do want to talk. Like, this is a thing that interests yeah. me, so I want to talk about this. And you end up making something leaden that feels very either, whether, either pretentious or insincere sure. or something like that. Or sometimes if you try to be clever or sort of stick with the with the plot, you get something that can seem a little bit airless or generic because you're just informed by other things like that. It takes a real confidence in yourself as a storyteller to be able to kind of follow your vision without being able to see exactly what's coming. And keeping it's, your ego out of the way of what the story is telling you yeah. it needs to be. And yet at the same time, you have to have enough ego to keep going. Right. <laughs> you so know, you wouldn't it's, get it's a balancing that act. far. Yeah. Um, I'm going to drop a Kubrick reference on you right now. All right, let me just so, cue the theme. There's a recent book that came out about the making of 2001, mm-hmm. which is one of my obsessive geek. I mean, I have several books within visual. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> within sight right four, now. Four books within sight of us right now. Um, but anyway, in this book, uh, to what you're talking about, Kubrick has a pretty interesting take, which is he, he was talking about people writing screenplays. And he was saying, oh, people go wrong because they sit down to write a screenplay, in quotes. Yeah. And the process that he used uh, with Arthur, Arthur C. Clarke was, no, 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 
we're going to write a book first. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to adapt the book into a screenplay. And his point being that when you write a book, a novel in that case, it's a novel. It's, it's, it, can inc it has room for vast sweeping concepts and threads coming together. It has room to arrive after hundreds of pages at very weighty topics and themes. So if you, if you set out to try and write down, um, you know, a bone is thrown in the air and, and cuts to a whirling space station. And we've now, when you have a novel that contains all of the backstory that's behind the bone being thrown in the air and, and has all of the, the backstory of how we arrived at the spinning spaceship in the air, you're sitting down and you're saying, how do I put this on the screen? Yeah. This is a, you know, 280 page novel. How the hell am I going to put this on the screen? I mean, you've, you've, you've probably successfully written screenplays and completed them. I'm the type of person who's probably started a dozen of them and never right. got past a page or two because it's not a form that I understand. But when I, when I, but I have successfully adapted other material. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in reading that, it kind of, he made it clear why that was possible for me, where it's, it doesn't feel possible for me to sort of sit down and write a screenplay or mm -hmm. sit down and write a play. And I think for for Wendell Harris, he had that he had all these stories that um, Street told him, and he had access to him. He visited him in prison. Yep. Um, and so he used those stories. Through that, he kept probably representative vignettes because it's not a linear screenplay. Really, it's it's very it's very episodic. It's, it's very episodic, yeah. and it doesn't even show you how he got in to many of the places. You know what I mean? It's sort of just. It's, it, it drops him. All of a sudden, I have a job on as a lawyer. It doesn't yeah. show you how he got that position. But it doesn't need to because it's it. we don't need that as viewers. So that's what I'm saying. I think he's taking a real-life version of what Kubrick was talking about. And so he has all these interviews with Street. And then he figured out how to take representative pieces of that yeah. and put it on the screen. And it also is so true to the material and so mm -hmm. true to the consciousness that he's trying to get at, which is why amazing watching this movie now – I'm a, I've, I've been watching Atlanta and, um, and Get Out and all these other shows that are presenting black life to us in ways that are using all of the new quote unquote sort of storytelling styles, but they're really not new. They're just, man, it's just such a direct line to this movie. And so, yeah. Kubrick. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna edit out that long pause of um, yeah, yeah of nothing that'll, to say, that'll but be for an ad break, that'll be perfect. an ad break. Yeah, that was a good ad break. Full cast and crew is brought to you by Behemoth from Monkey Brain Comics. Behemoth is the dirty dozen meets the fly with a little Spider-Man thrown in. Kids are turning into monsters, and the government steps in to keep things quiet. Some are never heard from again, but others are forced on suicide missions on behalf of a world that hates them as part of Project Behemoth. Find it on monkeybraincomics.com or Comixology today. Um, there really, yeah, isn't, there really isn't much to go down in terms of the full cast and crew page because as we said, almost everybody never had any other yeah. acting credits. Yeah, I think there are a couple small things. There was somebody that was in a Bruce Lee uh, movie, <laughs> but I think even that was somebody in the crew. Um, great, man, a great director. I just feel like we were... You know, I, I want to see all the movies that he would have made between 1990 and now. Yeah. And maybe he still can. I mean. Um, it's funny because he's now what? I think they said he was. Um, well, if he was a contemporary of the actors you mentioned at Juilliard. Yeah, so he's in his 60s. 60s? Um, I mean, you're a, you're a Juilliard guy. I mean, I am not. I mean, I've. I thought you went to Juilliard. There. Oh, I didn't go anywhere. I, I mean, I went to Why Northwestern. Why did you go to Juilliard? I think it's because of my diction. And my I've never seen your craft addiction. <laughs> um, I'm going to move. You have that some Juilliard connection, though. Um, Man, yeah, I've I'm known a lot of Juilliard people. I'm starting to worry that I'm completely making things up in my mind. Yeah, there is no Chameleon Street. There was no such movie. <laughs> you must uh, have been in a show at. Oh, you were in a show at Juilliard. No. Did no, your... I've applied to Juilliard. Maybe that's what you're thinking of. Maybe you, you, know, you were the, rejected the reject, from Juilliard. Yes. Three times, three times. I, I guess, you know what it is, Chris? I have some familiarity with Juilliard, with Juilliard actors and what that means to be a Juilliard actor. And to me, you are uh, representative of the, the caliber of actor that tends to come out of Juilliard. 
I didn't need it. I, so that's what I, that's why, I'll that's probably it. why I think, cause you're, you're a sort of classically trained person who nonetheless has, has a contemporary set of interests that, that feels to me like the types of actors that I have encountered coming out of Juilliard. So that's why I think of you as a Juilliard person. I'll take it. Um, he, uh, I, I would be curious. I would love to know, um, I don't know. I'm starting to get curious and think like a documentary about Wendell Harris would be a good idea. I wonder though if he would uh, take if it he over. Would be interested. Yeah, I was gonna say he probably It'd be would great. Take it over. That'd be amazing. He's well, who's not interested in dead. doing a documentary about themselves? You know, That's he's what I'm saying we got to go to Flint. Uh, all right, uh, give me five minutes to go to the bathroom and uh, <laughs> we'll throw. I, I looked for Wendell. Um, there's a Facebook page, but it looks like a fan page purporting to be him uh, with some women posting photos of a very middle aged. Um. Uh, I forgot his name. Wendell. Wendell. <laughs> Sorry, it's late in the day. It's four twenty-eight. Podcasting my, is my intense. podcasting is exhausting. <laughs> Whew. Um. Yeah, they were posting some some sort of photos of Wendell from two thousand nine and and posting like heart emojis and stuff. So <laughs> I, I don't think it was a real authentic uh, Wendell B. Harris Jr. page. Uh, one scene had a jarring tone that was that still has the power to shock me, even though I've seen it now yeah. five or six times. Are you referring to the scene with his daughter? Yes. Yes. God, that's so well done. Yeah. Uh, uh, freaked me out. Freaked me out. It was very disturbing. You know, well, the scene, you know, and you'll hear a little bit of it here. He, he's, he's playing with some it's of his daughter's toys, scene, you know. but we're, we're not, he picks up a knife and um, he's wearing a, he picks a mask Masks are a recurring theme throughout the whole movie. Mm-hmm. Um, he picks a mask off the wall. He's wearing a mask and he he's speaking out loud and it gets a little creepy and he invites his daughter to come and sit on his lap. And then the scene is played as if he's killing himself yeah. and, and her. Danielle. Uh. Then you come to find out only at the very end of the scene, it's a trick knife with fake blood, which and somehow is, is even they have done before, which somehow is enough. more disturbing, not more disturbing than if he had killed a child, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's, yeah, you it's, know, I'll, it's, I'll go with this one. It's a great scene because the way it's played at first, you think, oh no, it, it can't possibly go there. And it seems to go there. So you're shocked and you're horrified, but you're not surprised. 
Then when it has the twist and it's revealed that it's a sick game, it's horrifying again in a different way. Because you're relieved that the daughter yes. isn't dead, that he isn't dead. But that relief kind of comes up short because you realize this is a thing that they do. Yeah. They do often enough that the wife complains because she'll have to do the laundry. And he says, but this is the fake blood that comes out. <laughs> Yeah, he goes like, like, I've done it. I I use the good stuff. (laughs) They've gone back and forth. stuff that watches out. I guess that's one of the the great things about the movie is that it it has moments like that that really require a lot of specificity in filmmaking and acting and editing and music choice in order to play that scene the way it necessarily must play. Mm -hmm. It has to be believable, and then it has to take this turn, which is which is believable as well, but in a different way. And then it has, it'll have scenes of pure comedy or right. scenes of um, magical realism that are, that are played that way. In an innovative way, he's reminding us that it's not just fun in games because a lot of the stuff played before that is played as kind of fun in games in terms yeah. of no one is harmed. Although, I mean, I don't, I, I don't know if I believe that 36 his, hysterectomies were performed without let alone, any, uh, let alone one without any medical training whatsoever. I don't know the, the veracity of that, but, <laughs> but certainly everything that happens before that scene, it, it's played for fun right. until that moment. And then that moment is so dark sitting here talking about it. I can't remember if the music choice is ominous or whether there is any music or whether I don't remember, but right. it's, um, but I remember the mask and the knife and just, just the juxtaposition of this innocent child. Um, and when he's spray painting the Barbies black earlier, such a great yeah. scene, such a great still from the movie where he's got his omnipresent early edition yellow Sony Walkman headphones. Yeah. And he's spray painting his daughter's, you know, Barbie and making white, her black. I, white idealized Barbies uh, black. You know, the headphones are an, are an interesting yeah. detail. And especially because to me, When seeing it now, seeing somebody who's wearing headphones all the time, it's such a symptom of like, of being self-contained and cut off. And that's certainly the effect uh, that it has in this. Again, I don't know if it was deliberate or not, but he is certainly a guy who is cut off and because of that kind of selfish, not really caring about the effects of his hijinks. There's the really kind of interesting and funny moment in prison with the comic book story, which I'm sure you react to. Yes. Jack Kirby. Uh, Steve Ditko, Steve Ditko and uh, moment yep. and a uh, great story about the guy murdering his his mother because she messed with his comic books. <laughs> Eugene and I both shared a mutual admiration for Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko. So we'd get together and trade comics, talk comics, remember comics. In fact, Eugene was in Jackson because of comics. He beat on his mother until she died because, well, let him tell it. So when I get home, and go up to my room, I say, Mom, what hath become of my comic books? I used to always talk like Thor. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> you used to always talk like Thor, huh? Yeah, I patterned my speech after him. Yeah. Sometimes I talk like Spider-Man, or Daredevil, or Nick Fury. Yeah. Or the Hulk. Of course, the Hawk really didn't have too much to say. No, not really. And of course, as a New Haven resident at the time, um, I have to point out none of the purported New Haven scenes actually take place in New Haven. Uh, oh, really? The street scene crushed. where he's on, um, where he's on sort of an occupied, busy kind of college town Main Street is clearly not New Haven. I think it's. Either Probably Flint, Flint. Or, or Detroit or something. I also think that the movie to me, and this is more because of where I was when this film came out, this is the first movie we're watching that is 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 a 90s movie, mm-hmm. just barely. It's probably filmed in 1989 or 1988 right. or what have you. But for someone who was renting VHS movies in their apartment and watching them obsessively, there was this moment in ni- you know from 1990 to whenever – where this was independent cinema, I guess. This was a thing. It was Mm -hmm. like the democratization of making movies. All of a sudden, all these different types of people were making movies, and the movies were more rudimentarily 
assembled than the big Hollywood features were. And it gave rise to all of these directors that came out of this same kind of era, like the Coen brothers or um, Alexander Rockwell or these independent directors. And it's funny now in 2018 to be looking at a movie and, and having it be as reminiscent of the era as the music of the era would be Mm -hmm. or the fashions of the era. Like when I watch these movies and I read a couple things online about the flat lighting, which is such a distinctive feature of these kind of low budget films. And as you were saying, probably what they had access to, the people that worked and shot whatever videos they were working on in the video services company in Flint, that's, that's contributed to the look. But it's also just a lack of access to professional equipment and what have you. You know, as someone who watched a lot of those movies in that era, now I'm watching them back in, and God, like, wow, it's, it's, it just really transports you back to a time that, you know, to sound like an old guy, it was simpler. <laughs> it was simpler then. But it's an interesting correlation to the time that we're living in now, where I think, again, you're starting to have more and different kinds of voices have, have avenues to get their stories out and maybe almost too many avenues where visions are getting lost in the in the mass of visions that are being presented out there. I was just watching a couple of clips today from Michelle Wolf's show on Netflix, which you remember from the Correspondence Dinner yeah. performance, she was someone everyone was talking about. And then her Netflix show came out shortly thereafter. And I haven't really been watching it or hearing much about it. And then I just saw people posting a couple clips from it on Facebook. And so I, I watched a couple and it was good, but it was... It, it felt like it was getting lost in the mass of other stuff that's out there. It's harder and harder for things to really become something that everyone's talking about. Yeah. Um, And that does happen. I mean, everyone was talking about Get Out. Everyone is talking about Atlanta. Everyone is talking about some of these other shows and voices to get through. But it's interesting to look back and say, at the time he made this movie, it was hard as a black director to get your film funded and made. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's still hard for any director to get their film funded and made, let alone a director of color. But now it's kind of like the same problem, but because of the amount of content that exists, it's almost hard to get your voice out for a different reason than it was then. Mm -hmm. You know, then it's probably just more pure racism or lack of industry ability to recognize directors who looked and and wrote differently than what they thought a director sounded like, looked like, wrote like. Yeah. Right? Whereas nowadays, I wonder, how do you cut through? Like, there's so many interesting things that I'll, even I will say, like, oh, I really want to make time to check that out. Yeah. But then by the time you would get to a point of time where you could check that out, there's seven other things that more immediately presented themselves. Absolutely. And you forget to go back and check them out. Um, like the Boots Riley telemarketing movie. I want to check that out because I worked as a telemarker for a lot of years in the 90s. And I'm, I'm, I always think that's a fascinating subculture and world. Um, and it sounds like his narrative is similarly fractured from what I saw of the trailer and stuff that it has that same, maybe some, something in similarity with, with oh, this movie. Certainly in some of the magic, magical, magical realism, realism yeah. and the, um, like I said, the sort of fractured way of the storytelling, um, visually it's much more lush. Sure. It is not flat at all, yeah. uh, but you're right. And the way I, that I would put it, there's a signal to noise yeah. ratio and when sort of everybody can afford a camera, what do you have that distinguishes right. what you're saying and your vision? What is it that you're adding to the conversation yeah. that is different? I was just looking up not. what, sorry to bother you, the Boots Riley film was made for. It was made for $3.2 million. And um, Chameleon Street was $1.5 million in 1990 dollars. So that's, yeah. that's probably about the same when balanced for inflation, yeah. right? So to your point- the much more polished look of sorry to bother you, the technology, the ability to have something made for a relatively low budget yes. appear vastly um, higher budget is great, but there's a there's a charm to the ragtagness of these that first wave of independent yeah. films in the '90s um, that we probably won't have again. 
Because even an iPhone looks better than yeah. much of the stuff that would have been available to shoot on this when he was shooting this on 16 millimeter or whatever he shot it on. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. No, so I, we I lose that. But maybe for, that's not the worst thing to lose. I'm sure for my niece and nephew at some point, they'll look back and think like, oh, how quaint. These things that are only in two dimensions and that don't have any <laughs> kind of sensory uh, input. Yeah. Technology will march on and, they'll, you know, it's funny how to even think that something yeah. like the kind of video look of this is kind of an aesthetic. And it is. an aesthetic. And well, it, it is does, now. Th- but that's yeah. to think that I'm sure at the time it was like, this looks, this looks great or maybe it looks flatter, you know, but yeah. it would seem very contemporary. Whereas yeah. now it, I just, when you look at like what's independent cinema now, I mean, they, they all look like feature films really, unless we're yeah. talking about hyper low budget. Even that can be easily, uh, you yeah. know, there was famously Tangerine shot on an iPhone mm-hmm. uh, a year or two ago. Right. And you wouldn't have guessed it by looking at it. Right. Uh, or the professionalism of this podcast. <laughs> I mean, the, the the degree of mixing and and precision editing that you know, in my edit- grandfather's day, his the podcast. How would you have done this? Would do, how would <laughs> you'd be slicing, you know, three quarter inch tape with an exacto knife and, and or chiseling it into stone? Chiseling it into stone. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a good sketch if you did like podcasting in the Roman Empire <laughs> or something. <laughs> Is it time to move on to Rants and Raves? Yes. Do you have any this week? I've got uh, two raves, and I'll make them both quick. The first is uh, a friend of mine is on sabbatical, and she and her husband and two kids are traveling the world and have a beautiful blog about raising kids on the road called Our Lives in Wonderland. Uh, Mm. They started in Australia, then went to Tokyo, Thailand, and I think by now they're in Bali. But it's really, it's it's a travel log about how beautiful the places are, but also questions about how to raise her kids. But there are also some questions about what does it mean to travel the world and the kind of environmental, um, the good and bad of going to other cultures and that sort of thing. And it's it's beautifully written and, and excellent. And I think it's just interesting. That sounds amazing. I will check that out. Well, I kind of would like to do that. I'd like to think about doing that with my yeah. family, but it seems so daunting, but maybe through this blog, I'll she learn She works some... for a uh, school. So I think it's the sabbatical sort of made it sort of a perfect um, time thing. And what's it called again? Uh, Our Lives in Wonderland. Our Lives in Wonderland. And then if Beale Street could talk. I mean, this will probably come up uh, when we, after we deal with the Oscars, but I got Are to we going to deal with the Oscars? I'm in a refusenik mode. Oh yeah. Right now. No, I, I vacillate. Then maybe I'll go see, right now, I'll go like, see you know class what? on Fuck Sunday the Oscars, night. man. Who cares? There's, it's going to be a bunch of bloviating self-regard. The wrong movies are going to win. Why am I going to subject myself to four hours of this crap? Because you, the listener, they, the listeners want it? That's they the don't. Only, trust me, that's they the don't. Only, then great. Then let's not. If Beale Street Could Talk is amazing. Really? It's really, it's beautifully shot. It's about two young people. And so mm-hmm. the, the optimism of starting a new life and stuff is all fantastic. And it takes some turns. I'm not going to, mm-hmm. but by the end, I was a little bit unsure, but then I heard somebody talking about it on a podcast that recontextualized it in such a way that it just deepened so, so much. It's not a thought driven film. So everything that happens is very slow and it, it shows the beauty of these people's lives. And then the, the ways that it gets eaten away and the horrible tragedy of not just putting somebody in prison for a crime they didn't do, but of the ways that racism and systematic racism taking away people's capacity to enjoy the Mm -hmm. most beautiful things about life. Well, I'm curious when you say that you watched out of the movie and you didn't know how to feel until you listened to someone else's thoughts and feelings about it and then that put it into a context for you. It wasn't obvious to me what it was about. There were these pieces in the air and parts that I knew I loved, Mm -hmm. and but I couldn't put them together. Mm -hmm. And here somebody else put it in such a way that I was like, oh, that's why it ends on this sort of ambivalent note. Even before that, I really thought it was worthwhile. Mm-hmm. And it was hearing somebody else talk about their experience with it that that made me see it in a, mm-hmm. in a different way. Well, that sounds great. I'm done with current movies, so I won't see anything else. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I've turned. I'm turned on it. Um, they have to win me back. The next movie I'm going to see is going to be Dune in 2020. Got I'm not going <laughs> to see anything until then. I just saw an article today that hilariously said, well... I guess Dune has moved on to the character acting casting because now they cast that guy, Daniel DeMalkian or whatever. If I showed you a picture of him, you'd be like, oh, that guy. That guy. <laughs> uh, this is the guy. Oh, that guy. <laughs> David yes. Dast Malkian. Yes. From The Dark Knight. Mulholland Drive. He's just got that. He's got a face that you cannot yeah. replicate. Well, Chris, moving on to. Headlines. Um, 
I don't want to make too abrupt a transition to this type of headline, but my first headline for you, Chris, is kids YouTube star shat on his nude friend for a meme video. It's all about the clicks. Mash sure that subscribe button. <laughs> not sure if you followed the story of YouTube star Blippy, hailed as the Mr. Rogers of the 21st century, which is a Sounds about right. <laughs> sobriquet. I can guarantee you he has no way come even close to deserving. In a 2013 video. Anything that happened in 2013 Stephen Blippy counts as news. takes an explosive diarrhea shit on his nude friend's ass in a truly shocking rendition of the Harlem Shake meme. In a statement to BuzzFeed <laughs> News, which is like, again, in the head smacking century in which we're now living, where someone makes a statement to BuzzFeed News about a 2013 video in which he took a shit on his friend. Blippi said, yes, I did make a gross out comedy video when I was in my early 20s, long before I started Blippi. Let's just unpack this for a second, because I count one, two, I count three horribly wrong things in that one sentence in this supposed apology statement, right? Yes, I did make a gross out comedy video, which seeks to diminish the seriousness of the offense, right? When I was in my early 20s, as if that excuses it, five years ago, long before I then became the 21st century Mr. Rogers, Everyone has a past. I don't know who Blippy is. Well, I was just, <laughs> I, I don't if know I, if I knew who Blippy was. I might have a stronger, uh, stronger feeling. This about is it. the type of story that would appear in passing uh, in like idiocracy, but is now part of our actual everyday life. Uh, my next story, Chris. Uh, do you like cruise ships? Sure. Do you like eighties television? Yes. Well, then you might be interested in heading to beautiful Cozumel for the Golden Girls at Sea <gasps> fan cruise. What do you think, Chris? I, I'm in. It's I'm, a five I night love trip. The Golden Girls. Five night trip departs from Miami, of course, yeah. home of the Golden Girls. The activities will include Dorothy's Bingo, a Golden Girls costume contest, and the Rusty Anchor karaoke party. <laughs> but of course, it won't include any Golden Girls because they're all dead. Aren't they all dead? They have to be. Estelle Getty? No, Betty White is not. I don't know how you have a celebrity cruise with no celebrities. I mean, do they bill it as a celebrity cruise or do they bill it as a fan cruise? Well, is there a difference? Uh, I mean, well, I'm going to say is right now, if they don't hire our friend Brad Locally to MC this entire cruise, <laughs> they don't know what they're doing. My last one for you, Chris, is a sad story. The P. Diddy statue was decapitated at the Madame Tussauds Wax Museum in Times Square. Well, that's not nice. Someone came in and knocked over the wax replica, causing the head to be decapitated from the body. The 10-year-old statue was intentionally knocked down around 8.45 p.m. Authorities cited no reason for the attack and made no arrests. Wow. Well, now, how did they know it was intentional? People presumably saw the guy come in and yeah, knock, the, yeah, knock yeah. the statue over. Now, I, I've never been to the wax museum. I've never been to Madame Tussauds. I don't understand the phenomena of going to a wax museum. Oh, yeah? What is it that you're, it's like, oh, there's a simulacrum of a B-list celebrity that I'll never actually meet in person, but I can well, look at. I mean, they they go for the A-list. <laughs> I mean, come Sean on. Sean P. Diddy Combs. Well, you know, 10 years ago, you know, he was an A-lister. <laughs> The only thing I know about Madame Tussauds is a few years ago, they posted a photo of Jerry Garcia, air quotes, <laughs> which looked absolutely nothing like Jerry Garcia. Yeah. Except for the fact that they got the missing finger right. Because I would think that part of the uh, the excitement is to be like, wow, it's so lifelike. But I've never seen one of like a famous person that I thought yeah, they was don't particularly work. accurate. Uh, it's bizarre. It's like a bizarre thing and I don't understand it. If I don't understand something, I have contempt for it. <laughs> so that's how I roll. <laughs> Until next time. We all need mirrors to remind ourselves who we are. I'm no different. Now, where was I? Thanks for listening to Full Cast and Crew. I uh, just wanted to remind everyone to subscribe if you haven't already, so you'll get a new episode every Thursday. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. So email us at fullcastandcrewpod at gmail.com, or you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at, at fullcastandcrew, or 
Find us on Facebook.